Good morning. I know it's uh, early. Well, it is for me. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to all the dads in the room. My husband is home with our children, so I feel a little bit guilty. They woke up at 5.30 this morning because we just got back from New York, and he was like, your kids woke up really early. <laughs> Okay, so I'll just start. Um, <clears throat> I'm Renee, and uh, this talk is something of a work in progress. It's um, something that I've been trying to pull together after about four years of researching influence operations and how narratives spread online. Uh, so my day job for the last couple years has been looking at uh, what has come to be called malign narratives and manufactured consensus, how people uh, create perceptions of consensus around ideas uh, or policies or politicians using social media manipulation tactics. So this is going to be maybe a little bit less theoretical and uh, more practical, but what I'm trying to do is marry the two. Looking back at um, how these things played out in the past, I think is something that, that those of us who study this have been trying to understand a little bit better. Not just Russian active measures, not just Russian propaganda, but more, um, more broadly, the idea of influence and consensus in society as uh, major media revolutions take place. So. All right, um, so a few years back, I got really interested in um, looking at propaganda treatises in the past and understanding how, uh, how opinions were formed and how consensus was made in beginning in the 1920s, so right around the uh, World War I. So I'm just gonna dive right in with the statement that reality has always been, to some extent, a matter of consensus. Um, using Berger and Luckman's ar argument in the social construction of reality, we have, um, the idea that social reality does not fall from heaven. All knowledge, including the basic, most, uh, most basic, taken for granted common sense knowledge of everyday reality is derived from and maintained by social interactions. So meaning is developed in coordination with others rather than separately within each individual. But I don't want to spend too much time on social constructionism. It always, I feel like it always devolves into like the college pothead talk. Um, and I also don't want to rehash the science wars, um, but I am kind of predicating this talk on my belief that we can come up with a kind of weak form hypothesis, similarly to the way there's efficient market, weak versus strong form. So effectively saying that there is this uh, social construction of reality, but there are also laws of physics and laws of nature, and those are immutable, and we use the phrase, tornadoes don't care about your feelings. So um, to understand how social consensus was established in the past, I wanna start by delving into the, uh, the old works about public opinion. So public opinion was how we took, um, how, how we gained information about uh, signals about reflections of social consensus. So a lot of what I'm gonna focus on is how this manifested in the press. Um, so starting with the canonical book, Public Opinion by Walter Lippmann, if you've never read it, you absolutely should. It's, it's absolutely fantastic, written in 1922. Um, the premise is that people live in the same world but think and feel in different ones. And he calls that a pseudo-environment. So we all operate individually in pseudo-environments, which are in our heads, uh, how we process information. The problem is that in order to achieve societal consensus and in order to have something that can become public opinion about issues that matter, uh, we have to, to manufacture uh, consent. So this is where Lippmann actually is the one who comes up with the concept of stereotypes and the phrase manufactured consent is actually Lippmann, not Chomsky. Chomsky draws on Lippmann's work um, for his own book. But the interesting thing with propaganda and crowd psychology literature of the past is that the authors make no secret of their belief that individual irrationality, limited knowledge of policy topics, and over-reliance on stereotypes renders democratic governance borderline impossible. So what you see constantly is the idea that uh, people do not process information in a way that is conducive to democratic society. So this is interesting when you think about the conversations we're having today about what has the internet done to democracy and the realization that as far back as 1922, uh, there is this idea that the problem with democracy is people. So um, the, in order to form society, we have to bridge the gaps in our individual pseudo environments and this is where uh, the emerging media comes into play, and as Lippmann puts it, people must have the world summarized for them by the well-informed. So who is doing that summary? So there are three primary players involved in coming to consensus or generating public opinion, and the relative power of each in the triad kind of shifts from time to time. Um, 
the level of trust in each has certainly shifted, particularly now. Uh, but, and, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on trust in this talk, because I want to focus on uh, some of the other more kind of malign things. I'm the one who's supposed to talk to you about the dark side of this stuff, so. Um, so I, but I want to kind of posit that we have these three kind of buckets of information and, and sense-making capabilities that reside in institutions, the people, and the media. I'm going to skip past institutions pretty quickly, because that's a kind of a treatise all its own. Um, an, interesting, an interesting book on institutions and how institutions engage with the public to shape consensus is uh, Neil Ferguson's The Square and the Tower, kind of covers it at various moments in history. Um, but ultimately, the, there's a, a kind of a, the, the premise is that academia, government, networks of elite leaders who are extremely well informed, who are extremely educated, uh, who are in fact you know kind of technocrats focused on particular topical areas of expertise, make major policy decisions and then leverage their power to communicate it in top-down ways. So they rely on actual expertise as well as the perception of expertise uh, to influence consensus. Um, groups of people, also in the form of networks, spread information at a peer-to-peer -peer level to generate consensus. So instead of a top-down hierarchy, you have a more um, kind of differently shaped hierarchies, but uh, more of an equitable kind of distribution. Um, this is where you get at the interesting studies of crowd psychology. So Trotter, uh, Lebon, Martin, Canetti, who re reinforce the idea that institutions and media act on the crowd, but the crowd acts on itself, and the crowd is serving as its own information vector as it passes information peer to peer. Since there are in-person bonds there, these are also extremely high trust bonds, and so there's a belief that information passed peer to peer is extremely influential in the formation of social consensus. And this is where you get at ideas of uh, influencers for example, who are uh, not necessarily even celebrities, but ways in which kind of high centrality nodes and communities become uh, me uh, means by which um, consensus is shaped. So highly influential people, even if they're not elites, just people who are um, esteemed members of the community uh, have a dramatic role in this, in this shaping of consensus. Um, one of the things that comes up consistently in the crowd psychology documents is the idea of the herd. And it's not meant to be in any way um, disrespectful. It's, it's the idea of uh, people operating as um, kind of a, a communal brain. So man is more sensitive to the voice of the herd than to any other influence. Man is subject to the passions of the pack um, in his violence and the passion of the herd in his panics. His relations with his fellows are dependent upon recognition of him as a member of the herd. Uh, he is therefore not susceptible only in fits and starts, not merely in panics and mobs, uh, but always, everywhere, and under any circumstances. So it's the idea that people influence each other constantly, uh, and people uh, derive information from each other not only during periods of panic, but also in regular times as well. And this is kind of where I want to focus for the talk. Um, it's very interesting when you read, even back in 1922, the idea that the media is fallible, the idea that the media is, um, has a business angle, the, you know, these things that we talk about today as if this is somehow related to the Trump era of politics, uh, the, the, the same stories are actually being written in 1922. It's just that there's a slightly different angle, which is that the media is um, one of the vectors for reaching people, and so this is where you get at ideas about how do uh, how, how, do the, how does the triad work together? How does the media tell the stories of the people? How does the media tell the stories of the institutions? And then how does the media kind of push its own angle as a consensus maker? Um, as Bernays puts it, the press stands preeminent among the various institutions which are commonly designated as leaders or molders of the public mind. So Bernays was, um, Edward Bernays, the founder of modern PR. So modern public relations. So this was, uh, he wrote a book called Propaganda that I'm gonna draw from. And at the time, in the, uh, in the 1920s, 1940s, propaganda was not a pejorative. Uh, propaganda became a pejorative after World War II. But the original idea was that um, propaganda was a way by which other entities could persuasively communicate information to achieve consensus, because without consensus, democracy could not function. So it was seen as a tool, as a way to, uh, to influence people to kind of shape public opinion, and then with that public opinion shaped, uh, sometimes this is, of course, uh, for, for the war effort. This was particularly common in the 1920s, you know, or 1919, getting support for the war. But what you see is um, the idea that propaganda is uh, information with an agenda, but it's not an evil concept. It's not a manipulation. It's a persuasive communication. 
So a little bit like how we think about marketing today. So when we think about the media, there are these sort of um, three uh, buckets, distinctions between these three things that early uh, public relations theorists see the media um, using to shape reality. So there's news, and in, uh, in the time of Lipman and Bernays, the news consisted of officially available public matters. So the function of the news was to signal that a verified event has happened. Um, through the process of reporting, interviewing, and then eventually as, uh, as, the information, sorry, as the technological revolution begins to happen, eventually using things like video, photographs, and other evidence, news is the communication of a happening. So um, even then, even in 1922, the idea that news is neutral, uh, that's actually not a thing that we see even in old 1920s documents. Um, there is a sharp distinction between the ideal, you know, the ideal reporting of news and the, the kind of ground truth versus the recognition that journalists are reporting uh, through a lens. Um, the other two things, though, are propaganda and pseudo-events, and I want to focus a little bit more on those. So here's our quote. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our countries. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. So this is the premise of Bernays. There are invisible rulers who control the destinies of millions. The rulers are not actually the rulers. The rulers are the propagandists. The rulers are the PR agents. The rulers are the people who are manufacturing public consensus because that is what is going to lead to uh, real world outcomes, policy shifts, support for war, et cetera, et cetera. So the power is in who controls the information architecture. The power is in who controls, uh, who, who, can, who can put uh, information, persuasive information, so information with an agenda, into the minds of people. So Edward Bernays' book's Propaganda, and then subsequently, um, Lippmann's book was called Public Opinion. Bernays' is called Crystallizing Public Opinion. Crystallizing Public Opinion directly refers back to public opinion in the sense that uh, Bernays' book is the how-to. Here is how you crystallize public opinion. Lippmann writes about the fact that we need to be doing this. Bernays writes about here is how to do it. Interestingly, um, they didn't actually like each other. So <laughs> this is a thing that I'm actually trying to reconcile because it, it seems to me as I read the works that there is this commonality here, uh, but there's also a substantial degree of criticism in the execution where Lippmann, criti Lippmann was a journalist, uh, founding editor of the New Republic, criticizing Bernays who was working for the Committee on Public Interest. Um, so the actual propaganda is being criticized by the person who recognizes the value of propaganda uh, but seems uh, squeamish about the implementation. So that's a very interesting theme underlying this, uh, you know, a, a, a belief that this needs to be done, um, but a extreme dislike for how it is executed. And so I'm uh, trying to go through some of the old historical documents now to have a better understanding of, uh, of why that was. But so we have propaganda. I hope that I've kind of explained how that takes shape. The other thing I want to talk about, though, is the idea of the pseudo event. And so this is where we go from, um, this is after, this is, this is right when television is beginning to happen, so the Nixon-Kennedy debates. Um, so this is Daniel Borstein writing in the 1940s. He focused on a different kind of media happening. So as what he called the graphic revolution happened, when TV became the dominant media, what happens as we shift away from print news, print propaganda, and move into the realm of the image? So TV becomes the dominant medium, and then there's a need to fill airtime. Nobody wants to have 30 seconds of, of airtime on TV that is not filled. And so you begin to have, imagine this today where our news cycles happen in five second increments. So then it's like 30 seconds where they're trying to figure out what to put out there. So the belief then is that PR, which is now an established discipline, uh, and the media work together to create what are called pseudo events. So these are um, events that exist solely to create a spectacle and news. So, this book, The Image, Borstein goes through how this manifests in a number of different ways. I'm going to talk about how it manifests in the form of events, but he also talks about the idea of being famous for being famous. So the Kardashians, you know, <laughs> the idea of that is uh, actually kind of comes out of this canonical 1940s work. Uh, so the idea behind pseudo events, the power to make a reportable event is the power to make experience. Again, the idea that, you're, that, that how you think about the world um, when there is a press conference, the idea of the press conference is it is a meta event. It is not a coverage of an event. It is coverage of someone talking about an event. 
Uh, and so you start to see these like these PR moments where a hotel, the example he gives is like uh, a hotel trying to figure out how to make itself relevant again. So it holds a grand reopening and has press there to announce the grand reopening. So nothing is different but from one day to the next. Nothing has actually happened. But in our minds, we now have the idea that something has happened because someone has reported on it. So we have this, this, um, this sense of uh, something has happened that we should pay attention to, when in reality, nothing has actually happened. So Borstein, one of the things that's also fascinating about these books is like how strident and, and, and like they are really taking a position. And so he thinks that this is just like the, you know, <laughs> the death knell of the Republic, basically. Like this is, it's all gonna go to hell. Um, and he's, he's probably not wrong, actually, but what he, what he writes about is how American, um, America begins to focus on these things that he calls images, whereas previously America focused on ideals. And so he talks about this distinction between um, reporting and commentary that was rooted in values, and values given to us by tradition or reason or God, um, the idea that we used to talk about ideas, and now we have this focus on images, which is this replica of reality. More and more of our experiences become invention rather than discovery. Um, we are deceived and obstructed by the very machines, in this case kind of television, that we make to enlarge our vision. So to briefly relate the two concepts, um, Borstein saw pseudo-events actually as the opposite of propaganda. He saw propaganda as something that oversimplifies the world by taking it down to the level of stereotypes and slogans, whereas pseudo-events complicate the world by creating stuff that doesn't actually exist, so kind of creating a layer of cruft on top of the world. So propaganda is kind of distilling it all down, pseudo-events are adding this additional layer of complexity. And as he puts it, uh, propaganda oversimplifies experience, pseudo-events overcomplicate it. Pseudo-events appeal to our duty to be educated, propaganda appeals to our desire to be aroused. And so what he means by that is um, the idea that we watch the news because we believe that is our duty to be better informed uh, means that people are consuming these pseudo-events out of a genuine desire to be more informed. And this is in some ways a... Um, uh, almost a, an, an, an affront to, you know, he's very angry at the media for doing this, very angry at the idea that, that we now have this, uh, these images that constantly occupy us. And he goes on to explain how images have actually become sort of full-blown illusions. We no longer have an idea. You know, we've gone from ideals to images, images to illusions, and we are living in uh, a world of illusions that are perpetuated by media that needs to, to kind of fill the time. So we have propaganda, pseudo-events, images, and illusions. These are our uh, kind of tools uh, that are being used to shape consensus. Now I want to bring us back to the modern era um, to discuss how the information ecosystem that we're in now and how our new communication architecture is yet again changing the ways that we arrive at consensus reality. So we're going to go from the image revolution now to the internet revolution. Um, so I want to walk through how we got to where we are today in terms of the information environment becoming um, a phenomenally easy place for propaganda and pseudo-events, which I'm gonna kind of go through in specific examples, uh, how that's become something that is so increasingly prevalent in our experience online. So I wanna start with the idea of zero-cost publishing. So in Bernays, Lipman, and Borstein's days, there's still these journalistic gatekeepers who are deciding what is going to get covered, right? When the internet begins, we now have the idea of zero-cost publishing. Anyone can write anything, anywhere. How many people had like a GeoCities blog or something? Yeah. So there is uh, absent the checks of the old institutional gatekeepers, we begin to have this thriving community, excuse me, of people publishing whatever they want to publish. Um, next, the internet largely eliminates geographical proximity from the idea of community and consensus. So in some ways, there is like the, um, the ways in which we reorient our networks is no longer geographical or proximity based. It's no longer familial. It's no longer community or, or culturally uh, connected. It is a reorganization of networks around things like ideas or uh, fandoms or um, interests. And so that's a, a, a pretty major restructuring in, uh, in, in thinking about, you know, kind of strong versus weak ties versus the way that we thought about them previously. So people, you know, the, the promise of the internet was the idea that people would be able to find their tribes. Then we have social networks begin to emerge. So now we're kind of out of the realm of, of Usenet and other things. Now we have mass consolidation of audiences onto a handful of platforms. 
So this is the, the grand consolidation. So it used to be there's all this information everywhere, there's some sort of small message boards and people. Now you have the era of like networking and mass, where networks are connected to networks, uh, and it's all largely within these relatively opaque systems that uh, we don't have very much visibility into, but we understand that people come to them uh, and they begin to bring their real world friends online. Then they're, they network through to friends of friends, and so the uh, kind of orientation of how we connect, and as I was kind of alluding to earlier, networks are how we're transmitting this information, so the, the transmission of information, the people that become part of the communities that we use to create consensus uh, has changed. Um, so now we have the era of social networks. So now as those networks get bigger and bigger, they A, have to monetize, and they also make uh, significant design choices related to how they show us information. So the same way the image revolution changes the way that, uh, that we see political candidates and things, now we have design choices that are fundamentally transforming the way that we receive information yet again. So instead of material being uh, used that, that looks good on TV, we have material that is designed, you know, I'm sure some of you have worked at startups and you have to like format your image at like 10, 24 by this for this social network and you know, and you've got your entire like folder after folder of collateral just because you have to because otherwise it looks like shit and nobody clicks on it, right? And so this is where we begin to uh, mold the very kind of collateral of communication um, to fit the, uh, the kind of rules predicated by this handful of platforms. Uh, and then the platforms also begin to serve as the primary means of dissemination. So you have, um, you have this remarkable uh, series where even the media itself begins to format its, uh, its content uh, to fit the design choices of the social platform. So this is where you see the swing back and forth from video as something that you hear about constantly or uh, ways that the media is extremely angry at Facebook right now because every time it changes its algorithm, um, <coughs> they're sort of at the, at the mercy of the dissemination platforms. Targeting. So again, it, as we, this is a business model related constraint too, but this is the degree to which we can target users with content made for them. So this is also uh, relatively, th this is extremely new, this is unheard of in history. Even as we had propaganda and pseudo events, they were published in mainstream newspapers, we all saw the same thing. There were three networks. Uh, now we have this proliferation, this explosion of networks, and we have uh, information about the individual people who are engaging with this content that is constantly able to be uh, used and leveraged, and so messages are now micro-targeted at precisely the right people who are going to be receptive to them. So this is fundamentally different. Then we get to algorithmic amplifications. So this is the virality engines. So now that you have this proliferation of audiences, information moves exponentially faster across them. And so algorithmic amplification are the tools that the platforms build because if they can see what you share, they've learned something new about you. So you're encouraged to create content. You're encouraged to amplify content. And so it, it um, sense making kind of changes as we are now flooded with information. Uh, and this is where we get at uh, algorithmic curation. So this is kind of the last piece of the puzzle where in addition to the algorithms blasting things out, you are not gonna see everything that's blasted out. You are gonna see what is curated for you. Um, and that's because we, we find ourselves in a situation where as users create massive quantities of content, as this becomes fundamentally participatory, there's this information glut. How does the platform give you a good experience? How does it keep you on site? How does it monetize you? It has to keep you interested. And so algorithmic curation, first observed in the filter bubble back in like 2005 in the context of personalized Google search results, begins to extend to other social network. And this is where we get trending, recommendation, and search are kind of the three primary curatorial algorithms. So that's deciding what information we actually see. Um, so how is this different from the printing press and the radio and the TV? I get this question like all the time. <laughs> um, it's fundamentally different. So. In, it's participatory, meaning we are actively participating in the process. So we are influencing each other. So that network of uh, people to people and that triad of institutions, media, and people. So the person to person transmission chains are go farther and faster. It's the precision. Uh, people are served things likely to appeal to them. So there is, once you have kind of uh, inadvertently or otherwise declared a bias, that's what you're going to see. Velocity. So there has always been propaganda. There has always been, you know, we can talk about the pamphlets after, after Gutenberg. Um, but what is fundamentally different is that even in person to person transmission, the velocity has never been what it is today, which means that, um, as we'll go into in a second, the information disorder piece of this uh, is that this information is traveling farther and faster than ever before. Uh, and then the scale. 
So 2 billion people on Facebook, 357 million on Twitter. So again, participatory, fast, and massive. So as it turns out, uh, this has had significant unintended consequences. So everything that I've said previously was actually a relatively neutral statement. You might be thinking about it as something that was um, you know, negative based on particularly the, the tech lash and the media coverage of the last couple of years. But all of those things were just things that were done because of a belief that connecting people was, uh, was of value. Um, monetization is you know, fine, everybody, everybody has to do it at some point. Um, but it's the unintended consequences that, that came about as a result of this um, that is beginning to have significant effects on our idea of consensus reality and sense making. So, the democratization of content production means that things are wrong on the internet. Now, this is fine. Um, that's no big deal because, you know, if there is, you know, my little like fan blog on GeoCities probably had stuff that was wrong, but probably also nobody saw it, right? So there's this um, misinformation that nobody sees as kind of a tree falling in the woods problem. Uh, but when you have this consolidation and the ability for us to communicate it to each other so quickly, it's that proliferation uh, that becomes part of the problem. So interestingly, in Bernays and Lipman and the uh, you know sort of olden days, um, propaganda was largely controlled by the media, the PR, and the state. Now, propaganda is democratized, which means in our triad of people, um, institutions, and media, people are propagandizing to other people, which is a thing that is, uh, you know, when done at scale, is actually somewhat remarkable. That's something that we've never had before. Because instead of having to spend a lot of money to run a campaign or, you know, put an ad up in your local coffee shop or whatever, uh, everyone has access to these tools. So, Generic misinformation begins to evolve into democratized propaganda as this becomes used as a tool for activism. As people begin to realize uh, that the power to influence opinions increasingly lies with those who can most widely and effectively disseminate a message, this is where we get at propaganda becoming almost a marketing campaign for an idea, and tactics that are used in digital marketing uh, begin to be used in our digital, in our political conversations also. So we have political conversations happening on a uh, platform built for viral advertising. And that is a thing that is, uh, that is, that is also very new. So um, there's also the absence of the fact-checking gatekeepers. I don't know how many people remember trending news on Facebook. Remember that feature? It was like off to the right. Um, and they killed it because they could. They killed it because they couldn't fix it. And that's a thing that is actually like somewhat profound, right? The idea that what people chose to share with each other. Uh, Fake news in 2016, in the 2016 election, was not about Russia. And I say this as someone who like wrote the Senate report, you know, wrote one of the Senate reports on Russia. Um, it was fake news was actually about a lot of homegrown Americans writing propaganda and bullshit and getting them trending on Facebook. And then you would see them trending on Facebook. And Facebook used to have human curatorial oversight on that. And then that was recast as Facebook is politically biased against conservative media because unfortunately the, the kind of BS mill was disproportionately run by conservative propagandists or people targeting Trump voters. And what wound up happening was these insane stories about Megyn Kelly being you know, fired by Fox or the Pope endorsing Donald Trump. This stuff after they eliminated the human curators just went viral over and over and over and over again. And so it's possibly one of the best indications we have, since it's so hard to get data out of these platforms to have real quantitative information on this, just the signal that we were getting from trending news was actually like the canary in the coal mine telling us that this stuff was going viral at absolutely insane rates. Um, and the, after they killed the feature, we really uh, don't have very much visibility into it anymore. Um, propaganda evolves to keep pace with the dominant information architecture of the day. Um, this is how we find ourselves in the era of mimetic propaganda. So again, the evolution, the design choices of the platforms mean that certain types of information plays better in the era of square images in a news feed that is memes, which means that we've actually in some ways dumbed down our propaganda to the point where it's like five words instead of a political pamphlet, right? So it's, uh, it's, even, it's even less sophisticated um, than it ever has been, but it goes farther and faster. So I don't know how many people know this, but DOD's actually studied memes for quite a while, um, years and years. And what they find is that memes can change individual and group values and behavior. They can enhance dysfunctional cultures and subcultures. They cost very little to make and test. People find them appealing. Uh, they have sticking power. So DOD, when it looks at, you know, and, and now academics uh, look at meme researchers, they're, they're looking at propagation, persistence, and impact. 
So this is how we're trying to understand how mimetic propaganda influences sense making, how mimetic propaganda uh, shapes consensus, how does the little picture, how do we measure the idea of impact? Impact is the hardest thing to measure. It is, I mean, this is advertisers. I think the Wanamaker problem, as it's put, is I spend, you know, I know that 50% of my ad dollars are worthless, but I don't know wh which 50%. Uh, it's the same thing. When we think about digital propaganda, the, the quantification of impact is the piece that, um, that we are, the, which is the most important, is actually the thing that we know the least about. But we do know. We have a lot of information about how they spread, how they go viral, how they hop from network to network. Um, a lot of information about how long they last, whether they're absorbed into the culture. A lot of, and then the least bit of information that we have is on do they change hearts and minds. We do know that they become associated with behavior or messages. If I say winter is coming, if I say this is fine, you can probably visualize in your head exactly what I'm talking about. And that's because you've, there is a sufficient degree of repetition and it's also been incorporated into our cultural group, right? Uh, and so this is again the idea that we are, um, that, that these are messages that we have incorporated into our um, way of communicating about reality. Um, sorry, my, I lost my font on this one for some reason, but um, there's a lot of interesting challenges that we're having now thinking about the idea of information glut. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is, is it fair to call this stuff information? And you know, is it, I think that it is perhaps more accurate to say that now there's a glut of content and that not all content is information. And that one of the challenges that we're having is what do you do when there's this like cognitive DDoS, like the flooding of the zone with cruft, um, that is what the platforms choose to serve to us because it hits the engagement metrics and is, uh, you know, it is actually something that we do in fact engage with and that we do quote unquote want to see. And so there's some interesting questions about in the olden days, um, propagandist, you know, there was a blatant paternalism there. And now there is very much the opposite of that, the idea that we should all have the, you know, have um, agency and the right to decide what we see and so on and so forth. And that if platforms get involved, they're censoring, which is a really interesting argument to be having because what you do see is still filtered. And so something is not making it in. And so how do we think about the days in which um, we are not all consuming the same thing? How do we arrive at, uh, at shared kind of consensus realities when we're all seeing very different things that are most likely to appeal to us that really kind of keep us in those pseudo environments, but also we no longer believe as a society that there should be that kind of paternalistic oversight that manufactures the consensus. So this is where um, the, our, our kind of changing attitude about human agency um, means that in some ways that fragmentation uh, is, is actually much harder to overcome and the entities that perhaps would be best suited to do it are the people that control the media of the day, which is not the media themselves, but the dissemination platforms. Did that make sense? Okay. <laughs> All right, so now we go from pseudo events to pseudo realities. Um, so pseudo events, again, overcomplication of real world events. So Pseudo events are ever cheaper to produce, ever easier to execute. We don't even need press conferences anymore. Our pseudo events are who tweeted what, right? This is free. There are entire blogs that are devoted to grabbing people's tweets, aggregating them, throwing them into an article, throwing a sensational headline over it and acting as if there is some huge controversy in the world when some egg with 12 followers said a thing on Twitter. It's absolutely, I, mean, I look at this, I feel like an old person already where I'm like, how, <laughs> like what the fuck is this? <laughs> That's why it's actually been really refreshing going back and reading these old books and seeing how angry they were about it and feeling like, okay, I'm maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm not wrong to be angry, but at the same time, like the world did continue. So how do we uh, reconcile those two things? Um, so let's see, where am I here? Um, okay, so now we have uh, with this combination of the ease of production of pseudo events, we have the proliferation and democratization of propaganda. We have the glut of content yet dearth of information, the aggregation of people into perpetual online crowds, and then the algorithmic filtering of our fields of view. So we're not seeing everything, we're seeing a very narrow teller view. So this has combined, I would argue, to create pseudo realities. So they're not the pseudo environments of the individuals. Um, they're actually uh, kind of en masse aggregates where certain clusters of people who see certain things, and you can segment this in different ways and along different axes, operate in certain reality spaces that are shaped by what they're seeing, how it's transmitted, where it is. Um, 
And it's, it's sort of these, these algorithmically driven um, realities that people are being kind of pushed into that I think we don't fully understand. Uh, but we've gone from filter bubbles, which is again the idea that uh, information is slightly curated, to echo chambers, where these are, you know, you can think of this in the terms of, uh, of Facebook groups. In the worst case, echo chambers, the distinction is that they don't believe the information that the other people are seeing, right? So there's a fundamental distrust in media outside of what is being filtered for you. So that's kind of a function of trust, but also a function of how people are uh, pushed into these. Um, these, uh, these communities, and then again, the idea of the pseudo-reality, which is uh, people who, who live in and operate uh, in this space kind of persistently. Dual-use technology, it gets worse. I wanna make sure, how am I doing on time? 10 minutes, okay, cool. Okay, so, um, now, <laughs> all of that that I've just talked about is what we have done to ourselves quite legally as Americans. So that's all just straight up, you know, our exercise of free speech and free expression and, you know, leveraging the algorithmic dissemination of the day. So that's what we've done to ourselves. Uh, but what happens next is where, you know, so propaganda, um, not to get too far in the weeds, but uh, it's sometimes described in terms of black, gray, and white. White propaganda, RT, for example, Russia Today, right? You can attribute it. You know who it's coming from. You know it's paid for by the state. Gray propaganda, the narrative is laundered. That's where you see... Um, something that was said in RT gets put into a uh, legitimate mainstream media source. Um, and then uh, black propaganda is information that is not attributed. It's stuff that's just straight up laundered through, uh, often using manipulative um, things. You might have seen the news story about a couple of publications running articles by uh, an Iranian person who did not exist. Uh, this happened with Russia too. They created a persona called Alice Donovan. Alice Donovan had articles in a number of prominent publications on both the left and the right. That is black propaganda. That's where it is not attributed to a state, but it is being run by a state, uh, and it's being and it's being put out by a persona. This is what I look at most of the time. Um, so the dual use technology, the idea that the social ecosystem that we've built for the formation of, uh, you know, as as it is a major function in the formation of consensus. This also means that people who want to uh, shape consensus for us, uh, such as hostile foreign actors, propagandists, terrorists, you know, ideologues, true believers. Ideologues probably shouldn't be on this slide for, sorry, it's a recycled slide, but <laughs> um, let's just go with, uh, let's leave the ideologues out for right now. But the state actors and the terrorists, right? So uh, entities that are using the information ecosystem to reach people that they would not previously have been able to reach. So. This is where we go from, um, you know, going back to Borstein again, we have images that displace ideals, illusions that displace images, and now I'm trying to think of a way to describe um, what happens when somebody else is putting the idea into your head, and where it is a fundamentally uh, malign influence, and how do we think about fundamentally malign actors doing it. Inception is the best thing I've been able to come up with, um, open to suggestions if you want to, you know, tell me what to use. <laughs> but the movie Inception, which I actually personally did not like very much, uh, explored this question, if you could share a dream space, access someone's unconscious mind, what might you be able to do? So if we share an information space with direct pipelines into the minds of other people, what might we be able to do? So Russia has run propaganda operations for quite some time, but it had to get them again into either the three networks or the you know small number of newspapers, and so it would take years for this stuff to happen. Whereas what happens today is they throw up a website, they make a Facebook page, they look like a legitimate media organization, they declare themselves independent media because who can trust the mainstream media? And then they begin to run operations as a, you know targeting people through this kind of malign black propaganda operations. And we've seen so many countries do this now. This is a global problem. This is not just Russia. That's just the, the most prominent example have a slide, uh, which is not this one, of like all of the different countries that do this, because they do it to their own people quite often, right? So governments do it to their own people. Um, and then the ones that get good at doing it to their own people, we believe, begin to branch out and do it to other countries in their spheres of influence, which is not entirely unheard of. Propaganda and you know foreign influence has been around forever. But it's the way that they reach people extremely directly using the targeting ecosystem, using the groups, and taking advantage of the social infrastructure that I was describing. So manipulators anywhere concede pseudo-realities. I'm gonna just walk through um, really quickly, since I don't have very much time to give you specific case studies. This is Russia, so this is, um, this is the old Internet Research Agency office building. 
So they segmented society into precisely, desi precisely defined units, extremely precisely defined. So young right-wing people got meme culture, old right-wing people got Ronald Reagan. Right? So there was this precisely defined segmentation of society where they came up with the clusters, they came up with the people who were most likely to, uh, to, to have some sort of cohesion around particular facets of their lives, and then they worked to create consensus in those communities and to create um, divergent views of reality between communities. So you're, you're taking the same propaganda, but you're inflecting it in different ways. So you're taking an officer-involved shooting and you're communicating it one way to the black community and the other way to the, to the, um, to the pro-police Blue Lives Matter community. So you see them shaping consensus around reality through this segmentation uh, executed online Going directly, uh, going directly to people. Uh, this is um, <laughs> this is Jade Helm. I don't know if you remember Jade Helm. Jade Helm in 2015 was when the federal government under Obama was going to invade Texas. Um, this went viral, but th this went viral, and you know Russia actually, funny enough, was involved. We didn't know it at the time, um, but but this was an example of this this pseudo event. It was literally a military exercise, and then some conspiratorial press wrote an article about what if this was Obama coming to invade Texas, and then the governor of Texas promised to have the state national guard monitor the exercise. He didn't say, no, this is bullshit, no, this is a conspiracy theory. He said, well, I mean, okay, don't worry, guys, like, we'll, we'll keep an eye on the situation. ISIS uh, created a virtual caliphate, right? So again, the idea that you could pledge allegiance and become a citizen of a state uh, just by, uh, by, by stating your allegiance to a virtual terrorist organization. Um, that, was a, that was a remarkable example of, again, blanketing the internet with propaganda everywhere. And one of the reasons democracy is disproportionately vulnerable, this, our response to this in 2015 was, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Um, so, you know, again, this inflection of information, this inflection of like who controls the information space, and uh-oh, if we take down ISIS, what comes next? It's a slippery slope, you know, freedom will be gone. And then we have, um, this is QAnon. Um, the, <laughs> this is, uh, these, I mean, I don't even want to go into QAnon because it's like you say the word and like the fucking internet mob, like, <laughs> go, uh, you, I'll, I'll, um, I'll let you guys investigate QAnon for yourselves, but, um, this is the meta conspiracy, I don't know if you can see it, but this is like ways in which every conspiracy theory in the whole history of the world is secretly created and is like encompassed <laughs> under Q, who has Q level clearance in the Department of, uh, Energy and, um, but people show up to rallies. There, there are large internet communities that research QAnon, um, who, you know, they, they put out these kind of cryptic posts every now and then, and then people get in there and try to figure out what is really happening. And so there are people who are spending extraordinary amounts of time in these online communities who believe, who sincerely believe that President Trump is the president because he's taking down global pedophilia networks and that the Mueller investigation, the report was all bullshit. He was secretly returning sealed indictments to take down Hillary Clinton and others in this you know, vast cabal and secretly send them to jail. There are hundreds of thousands of people in these communities on Facebook, on Reddit, and on Twitter. So this is not, I mean, we, we like, you know, a lot of people kind of laugh about it, but something is actually happening here where there are these realities that, that just don't in any way connect back to what we would think of um, as reality. And then again, the canonic birtherism was a nice kind of small scale example of this. And then this was another really interesting situation. Uh, I don't know how many of you followed Covington Catholic. Um, the kid on the left is wearing a, or my left is wearing a MAGA hat and the Native American drummer there was, um, there was a uh, Native American parade on the mall. There had also been, I think, a March for Life. And so these two communities kind of came together. There was this image uh, that was taken. There was also a video where he initially appeared to be uh, mocking the Native American elder. These videos went viral. And depending on what internet community you were part of, you had a fundamentally different impression of what happened here. And that is a very, very scary thing because this isn't conspiratorial, right? This is real, this happened. Uh, this did not happen, um, sorry, this, this was, it was real and it happened. Um, depending on what framing you saw first, you were likely to have had a, a, a very uh, strong view on one side or another. And 
This was a really scary situation, I thought, because there was actually video. It was real video. It wasn't a deep fake. It wasn't edited. It wasn't you know, forged. It was just a straight up real video. And identical video clips presented by right, you know, by right leaning versus left leaning uh, members of, uh, of the media took fundamentally different positions on what happened here. So um, propaganda, when repeated often enough, becomes the truth. Pseudo realities, when enough people buy in, become consensus realities, and they are consensus realities that exist in conflict with each other. Um, pseudo realities are fed by pervasive perpetual pseudo events. Um, there is this idea that if you make it trend, you make it true. The counter narrative, the correction, none of that will go viral to the same extent. Um, these pseudo events become the news. Then the real news and real people pick up the story and spread it, and then that, um, that is how once it's kind of left the hands of the initial people who seeded the pseudo event or created the propaganda, it becomes real through the repetition. Because a sufficient number of people believe it, a sufficient number of people find it appealing, they continue to forward it along, and then it's a matter of free expression. It's us sharing our political beliefs online. It does have uh, you know, profound real life implications. Um, as increasing number of people spend more time on social networks immersed in online communities than they do in face-to-face -face space, um, within these communities, manufactured consensus, um, it, it, it just isn't always rooted in anything that we would consider fact, even when it's related to things that are potentially uh, you know, fact-based. Again, as I mentioned in the beginning, this idea that tornadoes don't care about your feelings, right? Um, viruses don't care about your feelings. Like, the um, ways in which these communities begin to take shape around pseudoscience, vast swaths of people who believe vaccines cause autism, uh, and just operate in communities where that is the dominant mode of belief, and they work to spread and share that belief. So the, as, and then the, um, these sort of micro communities, these you know, micro realities, connect up with each other uh, because of collaborative filtering. So if you're a member of one, the recommendation engine will suggest uh, that you perhaps join another. This is how anti-vaxxers get sent into QAnon communities, into Pizzagate communities, into uh, flat earth communities, into chemtrail communities. So interestingly, there's this like, um, I wanted to get that diagram of like the, you know, the evolutionary chart with the dinosaurs. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have time when I was on the plane um, to, to kind of show the ways in which it's like this, um, it's almost like, ways in which they, they kind of share this, like, this common ancestor. So what happens when you have communities that spring out from common ancestors that are themselves um, perhaps not what we would uh, you know, consider to be necessarily the best um, representation of what we formerly thought of as reality. Um, the ability to accept reality is a profound power. And the reason that this matters is that the fight for that power has governments, intelligence agencies, political parties, and domestic trolls all wading into the area. So if you can shape consensus through this relatively simple playbook, then you begin to see anybody who wants to have that power wading into the arena. And previously in other information revolutions, there have been like guardrails. There were laws that were passed, there were regulations, there were regulatory agencies, there were things that were, you know, that we kind of put together to um, create a system of laws. Whereas right now we have more of this like state of nature, this state of, of everybody fighting to control the information architecture, everybody fighting to control the tools of reality. Which has IRL consequences because there are certain things where we do have to return back uh, to that shared consensus reality. Climate change is probably one of the biggest, right? We have to at least be thinking about, as societies, how do we solve problems when we can't agree on a basic shared basis uh, of fact? And that's where that fragmentation, I think, um, really matters. So I'll just kind of close with a quote. Uh, we suffer primarily not from our vices or our weaknesses, but from our illusions. Uh, we are haunted not by reality, but by those images that we have put in place of reality. And to discover our illusions will not solve the problems of our world, but if we do not discover them, we will never discover our real problems. And then he goes on to say, each of us must disenchant himself, must moderate his expectations, and must prepare himself to receive messages uh, coming in from the outside. So happy to chat more. I've got to run to the airport after this because I've got to relieve my husband of childcare duty since it's Father's Day. We'll take seven minutes of questions. <coughs> Great talk, May. Thank you. Uh, quick question on institutions, people, and media. Um, 
When defining media and institutions, is there <coughs> a great line between those two? And <coughs> do we often see media as institutions or people as media, et cetera? Yeah, the, the people as media line is, um, is very blurred now, in particular the age of citizen journalism. And, um, and I didn't really, again, like 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, Institutions and media were actually kept separate. So this was, again, not my definition necessarily, but um, media as like the fourth estate designed to hold institutions accountable as how it has been thought of uh, historically. And so that is the same framework that I kept. Uh, so institutions were more uh, academia, government, organized religion, that sort of thing. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's see, I guess I kind of have a question for the room. Who here has run one of these campaigns? Do we have any other propagandists around? I mean, I've uh, run ad campaigns. <laughs> I, I spent like, so for like 200 bucks, I was able to get the, the mayor and the city council people in Portland, Oregon to stand up and like do like a whole, you know, um, campaign, public safety campaign by like just promoting the tweets of that infographic of if you're going 20 miles an hour and you hit somebody, you're like half as likely to kill them as if you hit them going 40. They weren't doing anything for like transportation safety in Portland. so. I promoted these tweets just to their followers. They didn't see them, but they were they just turned on a dime. Yeah. Um, and both neither of them got reelected. I spent not very much money. I worked on the uh, <laughs> I worked on some of the laws to um, eliminate vaccine opt outs. So I've I've uh, been on that side of it on the political front too. Yeah. Oh, uh, Mike oh, can go sorry. first. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I get, get the feeling with some of these groups that. We have real challenges with that because the, the distinction that we use um, between misinformation and disinformation is intent, right? The, the intent to influence, the intent to deceive. Um, we try to look not at individual people and not at messages, but at dissemination patterns. And because a lot of it is um, are, how are people manipulating algorithms? That was, there's like a whole bunch that I've written on that, uh, that thing in particular that I didn't have time to get into because I was trying to go into the history a little more on this time. But, um, we, we try to gauge who's doing it. Like you can, you can tell spam pretty easily because they're routing people out to accounts that, you know, basically to pages to uh, generate ad revenue and things like that. But uh, oftentimes it's, it's just not that easy to tell. So, so one thing that I'm kind of connecting with some of the talks yesterday as well is that um, cults in and of themselves and like thought communities in and of themselves aren't adaptive except in context of what's the ecology. And so I think of like in um, the fall of the Roman Empire, you had all these mystery cults and things like that, but Christianity ends up winning out not because it has this like great grasp of reality, but because it had, it required really significant things of its followers in non-trivial and non-fakeable ways. And some of the things that I see with like um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders and people like that where it's like, I'm saying clearly false things in a community that cuts off ties and cuts off opportunities to me, uh, that can actually be very adaptive in certain contexts. And so part of the challenge is um, you can't just look at the, the facts of what they're saying right. and say, is this in fact, it might be a very reasonable thing for them to do and it might actually be adaptive in their situation. Uh, it just might be something that you're opposed to. <laughs> no, not opposed to it. There's, um, I wrote a thing on the idea of decentralized cults where I actually went and interviewed some people. I wrote it for Wired. It's um, under Wired Ideas under my name. But um, if you, I, I went and I found some people who actually work on like cult deprogramming and or you know kind of helping people exit. Um, and I was talking to this doctor and I was like, do you see? A rise in people in decentralized, you know, as as opposed to like a religious guru in the woods, kind of our old model of of, uh, of a cult versus uh, these these sort of online communities. And um, you see a lot of people who work on counter radicalization and counter cult stuff. Saying there's a lot of similarities that they're that they're beginning to see as uh, as online mechanisms become the dominant force for. Uh, pushing people into communities where they don't necessarily have the strong ties, but they also feel alienated in real life. They don't have a lot that they're doing in their communities, uh, and so there is that underlying motivation, which is to be part of something, to have some secret knowledge, to to have something to be excited about. Uh, and that's where I think um, I think a lot of the you know particularly um, the research communities around QAnon are they're just like you know it's a 
it's like being in a movie. It's like more exciting than everyday life. There's you know some secret code to unravel, and so there's a, a real draw to to that that feeling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I really appreciate your emphasis that uh, this is happening outside of the context of Russia, that a lot of countries are doing it, and that we're doing it to ourselves. Um, <coughs> and uh, I'm wondering, like, if, and yet, if you, um, uh, especially in the mainstream media, the emphasis is on, like, Russia is doing this, and this is what everyone should focus on, and if you talk to most people about this topic, that's, like, the main narrative in their mind. And so I'm wondering, like, do you agree with that emphasis in the cultural narrative? And as a thought leader, like, do you have any intentions to, like, broaden the conversation? Um, because obviously that emphasis has also taken up space and eliminated other perhaps more important conversations. Well, one of the reasons for the focus on Russia uh, is because, like, first of all, we have an actual data set, right? We have real... Um, three, four years of, of data of how it was executed. And so for, it, it is a, a I mean, um, it's been interesting to really mine that kind of corpus of information to understand how this is done. Um, the other piece of that though, was that the idea of interference and the idea of collusion are actually two separate things. And the, in the early days of 2017, as we began to be aware of the, of the Russian operation, people fundamentally did not believe it. And they thought it was like a vast Democratic Party conspiracy to undermine the validity of President Trump's election. And so a lot of the early coverage and the early writing and the early focus on it was really just to help people understand like this happened. And here is, you know, this is one of the reasons why we had the congressional hearings on it, right? Like people are testifying under oath that it happened. The executives from the tech companies who are not exactly, you know, well, depending on which reality you occupy, they're not exactly like puppets of the political party, um, but they're there verifying that it happened and that it happened on their platforms, right? Um, and so you do have this desire to educate people on the vulnerability using the information that we have. Here are the tangible visuals that they used. Here are the messages that they used. Here is the real world protests. I didn't even get into it, but I mean, they created pseudo events in the sense that they, they, they got Americans into the streets by creating Facebook events, saying that people should rally at the same day at the same time. So in Houston, Texas, they had a pro-Islamic knowledge rally outside of an Islamic center, and then a Texas secessionist rally on the same day at the same time. And citizen journalists showed up and recorded it. And you can go on YouTube and you can see it. There are dozens of people screaming at each other across the street while police officers are trying to keep the peace. And then what Russia is able to do with this footage, because now they have footage of it, um, is they're able to then mine that for more information. Look at this discord, you know, this discord unfolding in the state of Texas. They, so it, it's, it's remarkable like the extent to which you, that operation shows us how vulnerable we actually were to that kind of manipulation, even if it wasn't the most successful thing of all time, even if it didn't actually impact the election of the presidency, just the idea that this is how the manipulation is carried out, and here are the things that we have to be vigilant of, and here are the loopholes that we have to potentially close on social platforms, but also the recognition that real Americans turned out into the streets because of some Kremlin influence operation that wanted to get good video for you know <laughs> the, next, uh, the next wave of manipulation. Oh, sorry guys. Can, um, I gotta run to the airport, but um, find me on uh, Twitter or just uh, shoot me an email or something. Happy to chat about this. Thank you, Renee.